hard to believe. Thanksgiving is four days away. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'm ready. I know I'm not ready for Christmas. And I know I'm not ready for 2019. But since this is Thanksgiving week, what I hope we hear today, I hope we can hear from God's Word how the attitude of thanksgiving can be applied to our lives. And what's funny, I love God's Word, amen? amen. But we can even learn about giving thanks from an unlikely source like Jonah. We've been going through a series on Jonah, and we've talked about this for the last several weeks, or a couple of weeks, uh, you know, it's funny that a lot of people, they don't believe that the word of God about Jonah is real. They don't believe it's true. You know, we shared the passage out of Matthew. But a lot of people still just do not believe that the story of Jonah actually took place. But today I want to read to you the historical text about what was written about Jonah. And this is in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings 14, and this is what it says. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of jo uh, Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did uh, evil, excuse me, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat which he had caused Israel to commit. Here's what this says. Listen to this. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. So according to this passage out of 2 Kings, Jonah was the messenger who went out and he restored the boundaries from Lebo Hamath all the way to the south to the Dead Sea. Jonah is not a fictional character. He was a significant character in the story of the Jewish nation and in their history and for us and for the world. For the last two weeks, we've been going over how Jonah ran. He ran away from the things he knew he should be doing. He ran away from all of his responsibilities. And the reason that he ran is simply this. He did not want God's mercy to be given to the Ninevites. Jonah had his own opinion about how things should be done. And because he had his own opinion, his own attitude about this, he decided to run away. He, he decided and he chose to be disobedient. And I think we can all relate to that. Every one of us at some point in our lives, we have chosen to do something without giving the word of God even a second thought. And remember, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, and, and last week actually we talked about in Jonah, when Jonah decided that he was going to run, when he was going to flee from the Lord, he put other people at risk. He put the sailors' lives at risk. And we do the same thing. We talked about the storm that God put in front of Jonah to wake him up, to get his attention. And we read that Jonah told the sailors to pick him up and throw him into the sea. And then a huge fish came and swallowed him. Then we learn that Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of this fish. And if you remember, Jonah called it the belly of hell. And then Jonah prayed. He prayed. He fell back into obedience with God. And if you remember the story, the fish vomited Jonah back up onto the dry land. Pretty picture, right? I can see you. Again, you've got that mental picture going right now. But understand this, Jonah ran away from his responsibilities. Jonah ran away from what he should have been doing, from what he was supposed to be doing. But after Jonah returned back into obedience, 
he still had the original plan that God told him to do. It didn't change. You could say, God didn't let him off the hook. No pun intended. Couple. When we read in Jonah 3, we read in Jonah 3 that God came to Noah a second time. And his message that he gave him was exactly that in Jonah 1. The message didn't change. Now, now Jonah was to go to Nineveh, then he was to preach against this wickedness. He didn't want to go, but finally he gets back on track, and he finally goes to Nineveh. So this is where we are. Jonah gets vomited back up onto the dry land, and he finally gets to Nineveh, and Jonah tells us that the Nineveh is a big city. It's a huge city. The word tells us it took him three days to go, go throughout the city. And he was preaching the message God gave him. And this is what he preached. He said, 40 more days. 40 days. And Nineveh will be overthrown. Now Jonah knew the reputation of his enemy. They were an enemy of, of Jonah's people. They were wicked. These Assyrians were known for torturing and killing people. Historians actually say they were really good at skinning people. They were a wicked people, and they were an enemy of Jonah's people. But God is so great. He put things in place for the people of Nineveh to be awakened. They heard the word that Jonah was giving them, and what I want us to see is the response that the people of Nineveh had when they finally heard the message that Jonah gave them. And it's written for us in Jonah 3, verses 5 and 6. The Ninevites believed God. They believed God. Hmm. The fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is exactly what Jonah did not want to happen. Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to be restored. Jonah wanted God to wipe them out. But Jonah, he, he's, he's preaching the message God gave him, and he's watching the people repent. He's seeing the people get called to a fast. Here's the response by the king, Jonah 3. It says this, Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. See, when we urgently call on God, when we turn from our evil ways, then God's love, then God's mercy is seen. It's when we cry out to God, when we can trust in His promise. And the promise that we have from 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is a promise from God. Amen? Amen. See, the people in Denver were wicked, and then God sent Jonah to preach to them, and the people believed God. The people believed God's word. This wasn't just a group of people who got sorry or felt sorry because they got caught. How many times did we get caught doing something? Oh, I'm sorry. I got caught. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, please forgive me. Please forgive me. We're very quick to say we're sorry. We're very quick to apologize when we get caught red-handed. But the people of Nineveh, they genuinely repented. They knew their lives weren't right. They knew they were living lives that they shouldn't be living. Oh, but then they believed. They believed in God. 
They accepted this truth and they did turn to this God who forgave them. When any, when any of God's children genuinely repent of the sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And remember, God didn't send Jesus Christ into this world to condemn it. He sent it to save it. He loves us so much. God's plan is never to destroy but yet we do that ourselves. By our own choices, by our own decisions, by our own opinions, by our own agendas. But God's plan is always to restore. We just read that God relented and he did not bring destruction on none of them because Jonah preaching God's word. This is a pastor's dream. Woo! They had go into a city to have them all turn into a fast and pray, have the whole city, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people repent. Oh, that would be a dream for a pastor. Amen. Amen. I'd give anything to preach that kind of a message. I'd go to Las Vegas, Nevada and preach if it would work. But what was Jonah's response? If you have your own Bibles or if you have a few Bibles, let's turn to this very small book of Jonah. And I want us to see the response that Jonah had after the people believed in God. And when God chose not to bring destruction on the people because they repented, because they believed, and because they trusted. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 4. If you're able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Now, I'm actually going to start in verse 10 of chapter 3. This is what it says. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah... This seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Listen to this. That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, the God who relents from sending, sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his, uh, for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But, Jonah's, or but God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been so concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it, you did not make it grow. It sprang up overnight and dead overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord, amen? amen. You may be seated. This is truly an amazing story. 
The people in Nineveh were so evil that God was ready to wipe them out. God was ready to wipe them off the face of the earth. But they believed. They repented. They turned from their evil ways. They started following God and they believed in Him. So the people turned from their own evil ways. They made the choice to follow God in obedience. The people admit we're living wrong. We're involved in sin. We shouldn't be. We're doing things we shouldn't be doing. And if they didn't change, it would mean their destruction. But because of God's love, because God is a loving God, and because they repent, God changes his mind about Nineveh. That's God's plan. This is a glorious day. This is a great day. But Jonah gets angry. Jonah's furious. He didn't want those people to be saved. They're evil. They're no good. Wipe them out. Jonah wants God's wrath to be unleashed on this nation. Now think of the truth that Jonah knew. Jonah knew God was loving. Jonah knew God was a compassionate God. God knew that, or Jonah knew that God would show mercy and grace. This is why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. This is why he was trying to board a ship to go to Tarshish. But remember in verse 2, it's exactly what I just said. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. See, all throughout history, Jonah knew that the enemies of God, they got destroyed. Any enemy that went up against God's people were destroyed. And so Jonah is waiting for the same fate on Nineveh that happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. But Jonah knew that if these people were to cry out, if they asked for forgiveness, God will show them. Isn't it amazing how we can miss the big picture? How quickly we can be distracted from the good things of God by seeking out our own lustful desires. Jonah should have been overjoyed. He should have been thrilled that all these people repented. He should have been pretty happy because hundreds of thousands of people were saved. That's not what Jonah wanted. See how easy it is to distort the very topic of thanksgiving when we don't get what we want. In many ways, our concept of giving thanks is shallow and superficial. We tell the clerk at the store, oh, thank you, thank you for letting me buy something that I probably don't even need. We tell someone, oh, thank you for opening the door. But according to 1 Chronicles 16, true biblical thanksgiving is acknowledging what is right about God and giving Him praise and a sincere gratitude for everything He does for us. And according to Leviticus 26, thanksgiving should be the way we acknowledge ourselves before God, confessing our sin and knowing that we are redeemed. But in our story of Jonah, not one time, not a single time does Jonah tell God, thank you. He doesn't thank God for letting his message influence people to repentance. He doesn't thank God for sparing all those lives. Instead, Jonah gets angry. He gets mad. Now the passage tells us, and we 
can kind of read into this that Jonah is still holding out hope that God's going to wipe out the Assyrian nation. He goes outside the city and he finds some shelter and he waits. He waits to see if maybe, oh, just maybe, Lord. Listen to me. Wipe out those people. Don't spare their lives. Maybe, maybe, Lord, you can wipe out my greatest enemy. I can just picture Jonah sitting there getting his hopes up. He may be telling God, God, if you love me, wipe them out. From the passage, God once again tries to get Jonah's attention. But this time he doesn't send a storm. He doesn't send a big calamity. He sends a leafy plant. It's a big leafy plant. And Jonah's like, hey, thanks God. I deserve this. This is good. Thank you, Lord. So Jonah gets comfortable. And remember, this is modern day Iraq. It's hot. We're talking Yuma, California. It's hot. There's a scorching sun up overhead. Jonah's getting comfortable underneath this big green leafy plant. And God sends a worm. Not a big storm, a little worm. It eats the plant, the plant withers and dies. Jonah's not very happy again. Says he gets mad. So once again, we see Jonah's selfish attitude because he's not happy with this situation. In fact, he says, it would be better for me to die than to live. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry because you're not getting what you want? Is it right for you to be mad because things aren't going your way? It is, what Job says. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Here's how the Lord replies. Jonah 4, verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight, and... Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? Jonah, if you would just have pity on this plant, maybe you would understand how much more reason God has to show pity on all the people in the great city of Nineveh. See, church, too many times our thankfulness is conditional on us getting our needs met. Too many times our thankfulness is conditional on if we get what we want. Think of the vine. Think of this big green, green leafy plant. And no, it's not spinach. I'm just kidding. Jonah was happy with that vine. God's word says he got comfortable underneath that big green leafy plant. But when Jonah saw that the plant withered and died, he got mad. Jonah, not once did he thank God for the vine. Not once did he thank God for giving him a word to preach. Not once did he thank God for saving his life. Not once did he thank God for sending a huge fish. Jonah didn't even thank God for putting him on the right path, the path of obedience. And as we just said, Jonah never thanked God for sparing the city of Nineveh. The concept of thanks and thanksgiving appears in the NIV approximately 133 times. Old Testament and New Testament. 133 times. 
Not a single time do we see any of those references in the book of Jonah. But yet in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 it says, We are to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We can learn a lot of great lessons from Jonah in this very short book. But one concept that we can't learn from Jonah is about the attitude of gratitude. In case you haven't figured it out, I'll give you some great insight today. Here is a fact of life. Life doesn't always go the way we want. I'm pretty smart, aren't I? That's why you're stuck with me for four more years. <laughs> but we must understand that our actions, our attitudes, our opinions should never, never have a higher priority than the will of God. There's an old saying, what would Jesus do? Yeah. Kind of funny how we can put that in line with Jonah. But this is maybe a phrase that we need to keep in mind. What would Jonah, what would Jonah do? Then what would Jesus do? If our actions, if the way that we're living is not demonstrated by Jesus Christ himself, then you've got the wrong spirit. Maybe we're not living our life right. It's God's will to give us what we want in life. If God lives, gives us a green, leafy plant, praise God. If he causes it to wither or die, Praise God. Regardless of what happened, we are called to give God in all circumstances. This is how we demonstrate that we know that God's will is good and is right for our lives. Do you realize every time you share a sincere and loving thank you to someone, you're sharing the word of God? thought about that before? A sincere thank you is biblical. Every time you extend a genuine gratitude to another person, you are sharing a solid biblical teaching. The problem comes when we fake it. And we become a nation, we become a society, we become a world that's gotten really good at being lazy in our Thanksgiving. Our lives each and every day, we must be a biblical and loving illustration of thanksgiving of who God is and what God has done for us. And I'd love to say that you go to church three or four times a year, you'll understand this concept, but you can't. This doesn't happen. We cannot truly understand biblical thanksgiving unless we put God in his rightful place in our life. This is a great season for us to turn back to God. Give Christ full reign in our lives. From the story that we've gone over in the last three weeks and from Jonah, I think he missed out on this concept. He didn't get it. Many people teach that the story of Jonah is about redemption. It's about the great city of Nineveh being restored. It's not really what the story is about. The story is not about Nineveh. In fact, if you look in history, Nineveh. They turn back into their sinful ways and they're destroyed 140 years later. This story is about a man 
a man with the wrong heart. Jonah really would have preferred for this city to be destroyed. He didn't care about the people. He didn't care about those who were living there. He wanted them wiped out. The passage says there are 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many, many animals. So if there were 120,000 young children, there have been many equations that have been used to estimate that there were between 600,000 to maybe even a million people in this city. <coughs> and Jonah didn't care about them. Just like he didn't care about a green leafy plant. But God cared. God asked, should I have not have, con have concern for this great city of Nineveh, all the people that live there, and even the animals? And I find it odd. That's where the story ends. It ends with a question mark. It ends with this question. For, for three weeks, we've been going over the story of Jonah, and that's how it ends? It ends because... It's about us. It's about you and me here today. So the question that we must answer is this. What do we love? What are your priorities? Do you love and demonstrate the attitude of biblical thanksgiving each and every day? Or is it weak and superficial? Maybe you're like Jonah, and you get angry with God because life just doesn't go your way. A time of reflection can demonstrate our priorities. A time of meditation can help us to, to discern what's important to us. Is it your hobbies, your job, your money, your family? What is it that has the highest priority in your life? And if it's not Jesus Christ, he died. There's a problem. Church, we can get caught up in the day-to-day -day routines of life. We can get caught up in our jobs and our circumstances. And it's real easy to get focused on things that just don't matter. Things that aren't even good for us. See, the danger is this. When we focus on ourselves, it's easy to overlook the people around us that God sees as a priority. Jonah lost track. He lost focus of the people that are in Nineveh. But if we step out of our life, if we do an assessment, we can see what our priorities are. But what I hope that we would see is if we were to look back and, and reflect on this, what we need to ask is what does God see out of our lives? What do others see? when they look at us. See, in my imagination, I can just see hundreds of thousands of people that may be in heaven right now because Jonah shared the message of God to them. They repented. They believed. Don't you just know that hundreds of thousands of people are in heaven right now? And Jonah didn't even care about it. Jonah wasn't grateful. He wasn't thankful. See, our takeaway today is this. In our lives, each and every day, we have to demonstrate a true biblical grateful heart and not a Jonah heart. 
But it's easy to have a Jonah heart when we get focused on the wrong things. This Thanksgiving season, my challenge is this. Look past your own circumstances. Look to Christ. Believe in God. Turn back to him, Christ, the Messiah, a Savior who gave his life for us. And he did that so that we can receive eternal glory. As our praise team comes back to the front. I want us just to take a moment of reflection about where we are today. What, where are we at as compared to three weeks ago as we've been going through this series of Jonah? Maybe we need to ask, is Jesus Christ the true priority in our life? In a very real sense, is Jesus first? Jesus has to be first in all your relationships, in your marriage, with your coworkers, with your friends. Christ must be more important than our own image, our own desires, our own agendas. Because we must, evolve, must make sure we avoid this Jonah heart. If you would just bow your